I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me, heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things, and if on some point you think differently, that to God, that to God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. You want to put your marker at that scripture that Luke just read. We'll be making reference to it several times today. <coughs> There's a story that's been told in different ways, and it perfectly illustrates what I want to convey in today's lesson. Actually, I'm going to tell a couple different versions of the story. Um, all right, here goes the first version. All right, there's a guy that's going up the road here in the not too distant future, and he notices that there's some construction going on over here at the bottom. And he decides he's going to stop and check that out, and he does, and he sees some young men there hard at work, and he says, hey, fellas, what's going on? And one guy says, well, um, this job pays $15 an hour, and I've got some bills that need to be paid. I'm just trying to get by, making a living. The second guy says, well, you know, I'm putting concrete on a brick and laying it on another brick. This is what I was told to do by my supervisor. I'm just doing my job. But then a third guy says, you know, here at this place, this is going to be the future site, the future home of the Rope Creek Church of Christ. And I'm building a house for God's worship. And within these walls, ruined sinners will find mercy. This is going to be a hospital for sick sinners. And in generations to come, marriages are going to be built and homes are going to be built. In fact, some marriages are going to be restored. Some homes are going to be restored. People are going to come to this place and they're going to, they're going to hear about God. And their lives are going to be forever changed. Now, all three of those guys told the truth. But let me ask you, and you think about this question. Let me ask you, which one had the greater vision? Three. Number three, right? It's obvious, isn't it? All right, let, me, let me tell another story, same story, just different circumstances. And you can tell this story over and over again. You just pick out any area of life and you can just plug in the details to that story. And it always makes a wonderful point, but this hits home with me. Let's say you're walking down the hallway of the hospital in Pikeville and you see some people standing around talking. And you come up and say, hey, you all, what are you doing? And one of them has a clipboard and says, well, you know, uh, this is a pretty good paying job I have. And uh, I'm, just, I'm just trying to make money. I'm, I'm here for a paycheck. And another person has an IV bag in their hand, and this person says, we normally go start this IV because that's what my shift supervisor told me to do. I'm just doing my job. But then a third person says, you know, I'm here because there are families that are suffering, and I want to relieve their suffering. There are people that are hurting here, and I want to relieve their pain. I'm here to offer uh, uh, to people that are hurting an opportunity to get well so that they can go home to their family and so they can get back to their life. Now, all three people told the truth, but which of the three had the greater vision? So obvious, isn't it? Yeah. Last week, in our sermon series called A 2020 Vision, we talked about the first very important uh, principle when it comes to living with a 2020 vision, and that is vision begins with the ability to see accurately what is happening in the moment. The first question in this series was, what's coming at you? Can you see what's coming at you? Um, this has to do with understanding clearly who you are and where you are in this very moment. And, and that involves letting God guide us through the process with His Word 
to do a no holds barred evaluation of our strengths and our weaknesses so that we can then uh, determine what needs to change, what needs to be expanded upon so that God can use us to be just like Jesus, to serve Him and to serve the needs of others. That's where vision begins, knowing the step that's in front of you that you need to take. Well, this is a three-part series. Next time, we'll talk about practical terms of putting our vision to work. But in today's message, I want to, uh, I want to talk about how we can put that vision in place. So we're going to talk about developing the big picture aspect of the vision uh, that we ought to have for our lives. And this is very simply the ability to visualize that completed building, not just each individual brick that's being laid or the hourly wage. And so uh, here's a more concise way of saying it. The key to a 2020 vision is to develop the ability to see uh, today in terms of what you're currently doing, where that's going to take you. Being able to see uh, the, the outcome of it all. Now, if you've heard me preach a lot, and most of you have, you know that I often emphasize the importance of every single day. What we do today matters, right? Okay. But in order to capture the full significance of each individual day, we need to have some kind of a vision or a goal or a purpose that's driving us forward. More than just getting a paycheck, more than just uh, doing a job that we've been told to do. We need to have some kind of a vision of the outcome that would drive us to do everything we need to do each day to arrive at that destination. I've been reading a very good book by Simon Sinek uh, called Start With the Why. It's not a religious book, but here's the way he says it. We need to have a why behind what we do. As in, why am I doing what I do? Why do I get up each day? Why am I making these sacrifices? Why am I saving when I could be spending? Why do I go to work when I could be coasting? Why do I go to church on Sundays and Wednesdays when I could be doing something else? And what he points out is something very clear is that the stronger your why, the easier it is for you to endure the difficulties of today. It's so much easier if you know why you're doing something to discipline yourself to do what needs to be done in the moment. And if you don't have a clear understanding of why you're doing something, you're going to see your life in terms of the day-to-day -day as drudgery. Well, what I want to say is that the why of what you are and what you do equals inspiration. The why is what motivates you to lay the bricks or to get the paycheck. Why is what uh, inspires you to deal with the setbacks and the difficulties of it all. <coughs> I've heard it said that when people lose their why, they tend to lose their way. In fact, in the Old Testament, God said, my people perish for lack of vision. They've lost sight of why they're doing what they do, and it was so easy for them to get sidetracked. Now, if you have a strong enough why, a clear enough vision about your life, you can find the strength to do whatever you need to do. Let me give you a good example of this from uh, history. This is a story I'm sure that you've heard many times before, but uh, there was a guy named Samuel Pierpont Langley who had a goal, what he wanted to do was to be the first man to build a working airplane. And he seemed like the, the perfect guy for the job. He was the senior officer at the Smithsonian Institute. He uh, had taught mathematics at Harvard. He had uh, been commissioned by the War Department to undertake figuring this out. And they gave him $50,000 to fuel his ambition. And so what he wanted to do is to figure out the how. How can we, how can we fly? And uh, he, wanted to, he wanted to have the same kind of level of fame that Tom Edison had, but he was, he was focused only on the how. But a few hundred miles away, there were two brothers. You know who they are, Will and Orville Wright. They had the same goal, to figure out this problem, but they were not going at it from the standpoint merely of how, they were operating under the why of it, and it made all the difference. They didn't have any funding like uh, Langley had. They had no government connections. 
There wasn't a single person on their team that had a college education, but they had one resource that uh, was spades for them. It was motivation and inspiration to deal with all the setbacks and difficulties. Now, although these men didn't have a college education, they were true scientists at heart, and so they obsessed about the physical problem with flight and balance, and they were determined somehow to make this work. And so they endured, over a process of time, countless failures because they believed the scientific problem was solvable. And they knew that if they succeeded, here's the difference between how and why. They knew that if they succeeded, they were not merely solving a problem. They would change the world. Mm -hmm. They knew that if they could achieve what they had set out to achieve, that it would be a benefit to humanity. Not just personal fame, not just a pat on the back that they figured out a problem. They were operating from the standpoint of why. And it was that why that inspired them and their team to surmount every setback that they faced. Now the Wright brothers' inspiration came from starting not with merely the how. That's so important to how, but they also were thinking of the why. And that, that was much different from Langley's motivation. The why is what made these men the first men to achieve man flight on December the 17th, 1903, not Langley. And indeed, once, once the Wright brothers succeeded, Langley quickly quit, uh, which shows that he, had, he didn't have a dream. He didn't have a vision for what could be, what all could happen. These, these Wright brothers figured out the answer to the problem, the how, now, if Langley had a vision, he would have taken their technology with all of his government connections, all of his money, and with all of his uh, knowledge, and he would have built upon that. But since the how question was answered, he figured there's nothing more than for me to do. You see what I'm talking about? I'm talking about the greater vision. If your only reason for going to work is to just earn a paycheck and someone else at your work is coming to build a career, don't you, be, don't you be shocked when that person takes off and leaves you. Don't be shocked when that person shows up to work for more than a paycheck and they decide to take on more responsibility. They're willing to work perhaps more hours. They'll volunteer. They'll suffer through it all. Don't be surprised when that person goes up the ladder and you don't. Now with this in mind today, I want to talk to you about three questions that we can all ask ourselves that will help us to define that why. That why that should be right at the center of who we are and what we do. These three questions, I believe, will help us to see the building that's built in the future and the benefit of it, not merely the drudgery of laying each of those bricks. Alright, here's the first question. What do I want? What do I want? Mark Twain once said, I can teach anybody how to get what they want out of life. The problem is, he was, he was witty, very funny guy. He said, the problem is, I can't find anybody who can tell me what they want. And he has a point there. There's some truth in that. There are a lot of folks who think they can answer this question, but if you press them a little bit, uh, they're going to be unable to come up with a straightforward answer because they really haven't ever stopped to think about it the bigger vision of their lives. They've not stopped to think about something more than laying the bricks of the hourly wage. Now in Philippians chapter 3, in talking about pressing on, about moving forward into the future, the Apostle Paul said in verse 13 of Philippians chapter 3, this one thing I do. Now what that means is that the Apostle Paul had thought about his life in terms of the big picture, and he had determined what he wanted. He had decided upon what was valuable to him. He had determined what mattered most to him. He had narrowed down all of the possibilities to one major thing, and that one major thing was Paul's why. Why? Paul, why are you preaching? Why are you enduring hardship, even at the threat of your own life? Why are you laboring like you are? Why have you made these sacrifices? And Paul says this one thing. He had it narrowed down. Let me ask you, do you? Do you have it narrowed down? Developing long-term vision, you see, means that you're able to answer the question, what do I want? What do I value? What matters most to me? 
What do I want to make of this life that God has given to me? There's a verse in the psalm that we quote very often, and in fact we often misquote it, but still it is such a powerful promise. Mm -hmm. Psalm 37 verse 4, it says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Now if you study that in the immediate context and in the greater context of the Bible, you understand this verse is not teaching what some people think, that God is kind of like a genie in a bottle, and if you pull the top off, he'll pop out and grant you your random wishes. That's not what this verse is saying. What this verse is saying is that when you delight in God, and when the desires of your heart line up with what God desires, when you, when you uh, delight yourself in the Lord and you value what God values, then you are always going to be fulfilled. You're never going to come up dry. That's what the promise here is in this verse. Now, it can be said that the opposite of this promise is equally true. You delight yourself in anything else, and your heart's desire will remain forever beyond your grasp. You delight yourself in money, let me tell you what that means. You will never have enough. You never get enough money, do you? If that's where your delight is, you'll never be fulfilled. You delight yourself in alcohol, I can tell you from experience, I can tell you from observing the lives of others, your life will crash down around your feet. There's nothing good in that. Delight yourself in lust, you'll never have a fulfilling relationship with anybody as long as you live. Delight yourself in anything other than the Lord, and the desires of your heart will elude you. But as soon as you get on God's program, friend, you're going to find your heart's desires being fulfilled. Amen. However, Amen. just as Jesus said, if you seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, all these things shall be added unto you. So the question here is, what do you really want? Not just for today, but for your life. What is the why going to be for you? That thing that motivates you and inspires you to move forward. What is the greatest desire of your heart? Now last week I mentioned Ted Williams, one of the all-time greats in Major League Baseball. He decided very early on in his life that he wanted more than anything else to be a great hitter in baseball. In fact, he said, a man has to have goals for today, for a lifetime, and mine was to have people say, there goes Ted Williams, he's the greatest hitter who ever lived. Now becoming the best to ever swing a bat in Major League Baseball, that is a huge accomplishment, no question about it. And with no disrespect to Mr. Williams, that is not enough. That is not enough. I believe that God has called us, his people, to uh, greater things. He has greater things than that in mind for us. In fact, he has eternal things in mind for you. I mean, not just the temporary things of today, but something big, something more, uh, even beyond this life. And so I'm challenging each of us this morning to ask the question, what is it that I really want? What, do I, what kind of person do I want to be? What do I want my life to be all about? Not just what I want to have today or what I want to do today, but in the long term, what do I want for my life? What kind of character do I want to develop? What are my goals going to be? If I can envision my life, if I could have that better vision, what would my life look like? And if you can figure that out, friend, and God wants to guide you in the process, then that will motivate you today to take the steps that you need to take towards it. One noted theologian said, the place God calls you is... Uh, Two is the place where your deepest gladness and the world's deepest hunger meets. And I think that's very true. And so God will give you the desires of your heart. He'll empower you uh, to serve Him and to serve others. But first, you have to determine, like the Apostle Paul, what is this one thing? Now, of course, God's vision for your life is for you to become like Jesus. God's vision for your life is for you to pursue holiness. And as a result, you experience the peace of righteousness. God's goal for you is for you to go to heaven. But I'm not asking you what God's vision is for your life. I'm asking you what your vision is for your life. Now here's the second question. What is the best possible outcome in every area 
What is the best possible outcome in every area? You know, we make our plans and uh, by necessity we come up with a contingency, right? I mean, if it's going to, you're going to go on a picnic and it looks like it might rain, you may be thinking, well, you know, what will we do just in case? I don't want to be caught unprepared because everything doesn't work out the way we want it to. However, I've been this way and I've known other people to be this way. Uh, some people do nothing but prepare for the contingency. They're always looking at plan B or plan C. Their entire life is built around some worst case scenario. I think that's a problem with our culture. We're so negative in our thinking. A while back, in fact, a woman was talking about an upcoming wedding and she made a joke and this reveals kind of what our culture thinks these days about marriage and there probably is some truth in it, but she said you need to be, you need to carefully consider whom you choose to marry. After all, this man uh, is the one that your future children will be spending their weekends with. <laughs> That's already planning for divorce. <laughs> right? That's not, that's not taking into consideration what the best possible outcome would be. Consider who you're going to marry so you can have a God-blessed, happy union with another person. And have a, a home that honors God. You see, that's the best possible scenario. But our culture's thinking already before marriage ever happens, what's plan B? That's not a very optimistic outlook on the sacred union of marriage, is it? That our culture has. We're conditioned to think in terms of contingencies because our best laid plans have been known to go awry. But when it comes to creating long-term vision, vision that's going to motivate you and inspire you to go down the right path in your life, I want to encourage you. In fact, I'm exhorting you today to be like the Apostle Paul. I'm challenging you to, challenging you to think in terms of the best case scenario. What are the possibilities here? Paul says, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. <coughs> Paul had determined to do one thing, and it was to forget everything in the past and to go for that one best outcome. Now, he's referring to attaining to the resurrection of the dead and spending eternity with Christ if you go back and look at Philippians 3, verse 11. And so Paul says, in my life, all that I'm doing today, I've got plan A figured out. It's the best case scenario. That's what I'm shooting for. I want to be uh, in the resurrection and I want to go to heaven. But you see, he was not, he was not considering plan B or plan C. He was going for the best that could happen. Let me give you an illustration about that. If you start a diet like I've started a diet for the I don't know how many hundreds of times I've done this, uh, you might want to ask this question, what is the best that could happen? Now I know already you don't need to tell me about <laughs> all the things that could go wrong because I already know the worst case possibilities. I've been through that. You can fail at a diet, can't you? I've failed so many times at uh, dieting, but what? here's the thing. What is the best thing that could happen if you would learn to eat right and exercise and take care of your body? If you're going for longevity in life and good health, uh, what's the best that could happen if you went on a diet? Maybe you would say in 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, I would experience better health than I have in a decade. Right? That's the best case scenario. If you look at the best case scenario, there's your why, there's your inspiration, there's your motivation. It's not the difficulty of eating right today. It's what you can do on down the road. When you start thinking about wearing the skinny suits, you know, I got a couple of skinny suits that I was able to wear at one time. I'm thinking about the skinny suits. I'm not thinking about the number of calories I've got to eat today or what I've got to avoid or the fact that I need to walk for 30 minutes. That's all the drudgery of the day-to-day -day kind of things. It's what I'm dreaming about that's motivating me and inspiring me to not have health issues and to have the energy and strength to enjoy my family and to serve the Lord. So if, you're, if you got serious, here's another example. If you got serious about your relationship with God, I mean to the extent that you said, let me find a place in the local church to serve. 
I don't care what it is. Let me read my Bible. Let me become a person that uh, prays every day. In fact, all the time. Let me begin to work on what's wrong in my life and forsake sin and move closer to God. If you got serious about that, what is the best thing that could happen? Now, we know the worst case scenarios there, don't we? Well, people fizzle out, they uh, get lazy, they become indifferent, and they fail to make progress, and before you know it, many of them fall by the wayside. I'm not talking about the worst case scenario. I'm talking about the best thing that could happen for you. Maybe in 30 days or 60 days or 90 days, you could have a closer relationship with God and experience more victory in your life than you ever had before. That's the goal. That's the why of Bible reading today and prayer today and attending all the services of the local church and getting involved and sacrificing for the Lord. It's not the drudgery of the things we do today. It's the goal of what we can build and the difference that we can make for tomorrow. Amen. You know, the world knows this. Not every business plan succeeds, but the plan is built and it's funded around the strength of what can be. Every business makes a business plan, starts out thinking of what could be in, in a positive sense. The same thing's true about uh, every team who would win the Super Bowl. Not every team does win, but the best teams build their season around that very possibility. Let's win the Super Bowl. And then they go to work even off season and they train and they sacrifice and they practice with the Super Bowl in view. That's what we're talking about here. We're just talking about it in the spiritual sense. We're talking about having this vision can affect your marriage, how it can affect your family, how can it affect your spiritual life, what, what can it do in terms of where your life could be compared to where it actually is. What might happen if you planned a future for yourself that was based on the best possible outcome in every area of your life? How might that inspire you to live day by day? I'm not talking about laying one brick after another. I'm not talking about an hourly wage. I'm not talking about getting a paycheck. I'm not talking about building, paying the, or getting by. I'm talking about building something. So the question of today's lesson is what are you building with your life? It's not that you don't prepare for the unexpected. We do that, of course, but it's just that preparing for the unexpected is not plan A. Preparing for the unexpected, that's always the contingency. That's plan B or plan C, but plan A is always, let me go for the best. And so Paul said, I'm pressing. I'm pressing. I'm moving forward. I've got one thing in view. I'm after one thing. And that's what motivated him and inspired him. Plan A is everything is possible for him who believes, Mark 9, 23. Plan A is I can do everything through him who gives me strength, Philippians 4, 13. Plan A is if God is for us, who can be against us, Romans 8, 31. Plan A is to proclaim to our powerful God. I know that you can do all things. No plan of yours will be thwarted. Job 42, verse 2. Plan A is to say, I will view my future in terms of the best possible outcomes, and friend, that's your life. You got it? Mm -hmm. It may be difficult to develop a vision for the next 30 years, but there's one way to develop the habit. You've got to ask yourself, what's the best possible outcome for the next 30 years? Or the next seven days, or 30 days, or 90 days, or 365 days, and so on. What goal, what dream, what vision can I put before me, out in front of me, that will drive me and motivate me to reach that destination? That's the question. What is the best possible outcome? Let that be your why. And then here's the third question. What is most worthy of my best efforts? What is most worthy of my best effort? You know, there's all kinds of options in terms of the direction that your life can take. So many options that you can choose from. Some, of course, are terrible. Some of those options are absolutely terrible. Some of those options are okay. But a select few of those options 
Those are worthy of your full devotion. There are things that we do in life that are bound to just disappear into the wind. It won't matter one flick tomorrow. Paul refers to those things in his writing to the church at Corinth as those things that are wood, hay, and stubble. Those things that burn in the judgment because they have no eternal value. But there are other aspects of life that last forever. There are some other aspects of life that means that you can make a difference for generations to come. You can make a difference in the lives of others for all eternity. And Paul believed that serving Christ and attaining to the resurrection of the dead was that thing that was worthy of his best efforts. And it was his why, this one thing that helped him to filter away the bad choices and even the okay choices so that he could devote his full energy to the best choices. He said, I press on, verse 12 of Philippians chapter 3. And he said, forgetting what lies behind, verse 24, and I press toward the goal, uh, verse, 20, or verse 13 and then verse 14. You see, Paul says, I'm going to give my best efforts to the thing that matters most, to the thing that will last. I'm going to, I'm going to spend my life doing the things that are of eternal value. I'm not going to waste my life on those things that are wood, hay, and stubble. That's what you want to give your best uh, efforts to in terms of the things of this life and the life which is to come. Simon Sinek in his book talks about the celery test. I'll end here with this because nothing else is interesting. But it really speaks to the point that I'm trying to make here. Let's say you go to a dinner party and there's some people there that are trying to get you to eat Oreos, uh, celery and M&M's. Now these people are successful and these people are trustworthy people for the most part, but they want you each to eat <coughs> the food that they're trying to uh, sell you on. But if you have a strong enough why, like the Apostle Paul did, if you have a strong enough why, you can make decisions based on that idea. Not what those people are saying. The why of your life filters out everything. If your why is to be healthy and to eat wholesome, if your why is I want longevity in my life, then you know that eating Oreos and M&Ms is not right for you. Your why has filtered that out. But celery, though, <laughs> that just... May not, it may not taste as good immediately as the Oreos and M&Ms. It might not be as satisfying as those foods in the moment, but celery lines up with your mission, doesn't it? Celery lines up uh, with what you're trying to accomplish. The Oreos and the M&Ms do not. In essence, the celery test acts as a filter to whittle down all of the possible options into only those few options that support your why and are worthy of your best efforts. That's why I said in the first lesson we have to let God guide us in the process with His Word. God shows us what the eternal things of value are. He shows us what our one thing should be. And it's, it's our why of reaching this great goal that filters out all the bad options and all the okay options so that we can be sure that we're working uh, on the best things in life. Ultimately, this test does three things. It, it provides a guideline for decision making, which helps you make better decisions more quickly. If you have that why in place, very quickly you can eliminate the bad things. That's garbage. That's not for me. I'm a Christian. I'm not going to have that, do that, be that. Uh, it also makes sure that every action that you take supports your why. You're not wasting time on something else that's not important. I think this is a part of the problem that we have sometimes when we get so caught up in the things of life that we neglect our soul and the church and our Bible reading and growing. We've not fully embraced the, the big picture why of the matter. So we're so easy, uh, it's so easy for us to get off track. But when you clearly have the why, you can be like the Apostle Paul and you can say, I've got my one thing. And that one thing will... will Make sure that every action you take supports that one thing. And it also creates trust within others.
Because if people see you living by those core convictions that you have for Christ, they can know, they can know that you're going to always stay true to your vision. Your children need to see that in you as a parent. And mom and dad, they stay true to their vision. They want to become like Christ. They want to serve God and others. They want to go to heaven. They've set their hearts on that. That's their heart's desire. God's going to God's going to give them all their heart's desires, and they are faithful to Him. And that's what that's what the big picture why or this vision for our lives is all about. And those three workers I mentioned at the beginning of the message, maybe their work was the same after all. A brick is a brick, but their vision was different which means that their understanding of the significance of each day was different. And so in the second message our, <coughs> of our 2020 vision series, we discovered the second principle involved in becoming people of vision. The key to a 2020 vision is to develop the ability to see today where our actions will take us if we're faithful to God in doing the things that uh, He's called us to do. It may be that you're here this morning and uh, <coughs> one end right here. In Matthew chapter two, six, Jesus was talking about a person's life, but he used a story to illustrate how he is talked about two builders, two men that were building the house of their life. One man in the story builds his house on the sand and the rains come and the sand erodes and the house is destroyed. But Jesus said, those who hear these sayings of mine and doeth them, he'll be like a wise man that built his house on the rock. When the rains descended and the winds blew and the floods came, his house stood firm. What Jesus is saying, if you want to build something, something that will last forever and ever and ever, something that will impact the lives of others, something that will have eternal value, Jesus is saying, build your life on me. <coughs> build your life on me and what I teach. And you can begin that process today by simply trusting Him as the Son of God who died for your sins. Turn to Him in repentance and obey Him in baptism. Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved and then serve Him all the days of your life as the Apostle Paul uh, strive to attain to the resurrection and eternal life with the Lord in heaven. 1 Thessalonians 1, nine says, For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the true and living God. That's the very best way uh, that you could possibly build something that uh, would have value for the future. If you're here and you're not a Christian and you're subject to the invitation, won't you come this morning let us help you. We can baptize you into Christ. If you're a Christian that has gone astray and you've erred from the faith, we can pray with you for you as you repent, seeking the Lord's forgiveness for your sins. Whatever your needs are, we encourage you to come while we stand together this morning and sing. You are only